turning on your camera, I'd be very happy. Um, it's a different feeling altogether for the teachers. And maybe for you too, you can see each other. So we begin really with a very dramatic and over famous, if it's possible to say, the beginning of our story. That is, it takes us 12 chapters before we get into our direct ancestor, Abraham, Avraham, who is the first person to enter with God into a covenant, which will then, of course, of which we are the beneficiaries, and that has carried on through the generations. So the new stage in the evolution of, of humankind from our point of view. And the story begins famously, as every child knows, um, with the expression, Lech Lecha. God says, out of the blue, apparently, to Avraham, Vayom Hashem al Avraham, who doesn't have the name, incidentally, that we know him by at the beginning. Ah, oh, there's something to notice, but his name is Avram and not yet Avraham. A day in law. Right? So not, not yet. Meantime, he's Avram, and so God says to Avram, God addresses him directly and says, Lech Lecha, go forth. I suppose that's the elegant English translation. Try dealing with the problem of the little word Lecha. Go, I understand. What does lecha add to it? And usually the translation will do everything but the simple, straightforward translation. The simple, straightforward translation is lecha means to you, go to yourself in some sense. That's the literal translation. On the other side, on the other hand, there is our, once we know something about biblical Hebrew, we know that that little word lacha is often added to certain verbs, and we we are we're taught that it doesn't have much meaning. It's just a, a, almost like an, a little little particle of energy that's added to the lech or kach, take, yeah, kach lacha, take for yourself. Right? Never mind yourself. It's really just get yourself together and take, get yourself together and go, something like that. And Ramban will make a point of saying that. That we, have to, we mustn't overread the word lecha, he says. We mustn't be too sentimental about it, uh, to read it to yourself, because it's really just one of the little style, style quirks in the Hebrew language. Lecha doesn't have much meaning. As against Ramban, there is the whole Midrashic tradition. And the Midrashic tradition sees meaning in the word lecha, even so, at first it seems... Uh, a little, a little suppression. Hello? Can you hear me? Yes, yes, we hear you, Aviva. Just your Can video you is not, not working so well. I, I, I've lost the connection somehow. Mm-hmm. It says connecting. Can you do something? It's just going round and round. Um, so go out and then come back in with the video. Out and come back in. Okay. Um, I don't see how to go go out particularly. Do you leave me to? Uh, do you leave me to come back? Yeah. There's no leave meeting on on the screen. All right, I'm going to come back in. The video. Eric? Let okay. me go back in because it just, I lost the connection. Do we have sound? She could hear me. Right. She says they can hear me, but I can't uh, join the meeting. Aviva, we hear you, we just don't see you. You don't see me. Okay, so it's worth trying to. Okay. So what do we do now? It says join meeting. All right, let's join. Um, I think you might have called with your phone. You you have to do dial in with your computer. No, no, no. The phone is the sound. We need a picture. 
the, fa the phone is working. Okay. Can I do this? Sorry, let me see. Okay, here we are. Okay, you can hear me? Okay. Yes, you can hear me? Can we see you? Yes, we can hear you. Can you see me? I'm looking. One can second. you see me here? No? After all that? Here. Start video. Oh, there we go. Yeah. There you go. Okay. Can you see me? Okay. <laughs> Sorry about that. Okay. Lech lecha. You are contemplating that little word, lecha. Get going, and so, and so on some level, according to the plain reading. From your land, your birthplace, and from the house of your father, El Ha'aretz Asher Areka, to the land which I will show you. That is, God is very systematic in talking to Abraham and in detailing him exactly what Abraham is to leave from, where he is to, what, what are the, 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 the circles of places that he is to start his journey from from his country, from his immediate neighborhood, let's say, and from his particular family. So it's as if it's being very, very, made very clear to Abraham, not only geographically, but perhaps also emotionally, what he is leaving behind in this journey. That is, there are costs, there are, it's not, it's not a simple thing to ask this of Abraham. As for the rewards of the journey, at first, there seems to be God seems to be making a point of not offering him any clear satisfaction. I am not telling you where you're going. How does God say that? He says, El Ha'aretz Asher Areka. What is your destination? I'll show you. When you get there, then you, it'll become clear to you. Meantime, you travel blind. You travel without knowing where you're going. So that is making quite a big demand of Abraham. Leave everything you know, leave everything that gives your life specifics and reality, and go on a journey. What is that little word, lacha, according to Rashi? According to Rashi, the reward of the journey is encapsulated in the little word, lacha. How? Lacha, Rashi says, if you look at number one on your source page, lech lacha. Rashi, in the first thing he does is translate the word lecha. Lehana'atcha ulatovatcha. Right, he's not going with the idea that we shouldn't interpret. He's interpreting. And he says it means it'll be go and it will be for your benefit and for your good. You will not lose, you will, you will gain from this journey. And in order to spell that out a little more, Rashi tells us something that the text didn't tell us so, so, so clearly. What is the one thing that Abraham needs in his life? What is the one thing, what is the essential part of the story of Abraham before God says Lecha? We have a few verses at the end of last week's Parsha, just before Lecha, in which Abraham is introduced. And he's introduced as a member of his family, and we're told two very important facts about Abraham. Who was he? How does the story begin? Who was he before God said Lecha? There's something in us, quite rightly, I think, that always wants to know the background of the great moment. There's a great moment of revelation. But who was Abraham? You've got to tell us something about him. Why did God choose him, for instance? That would be a, a legitimate question. There are all these people in the world. Why did God zoom in excuse me, on, on, on Abraham, yes? Why did he choose him? Because we're not told 
that he was a particularly good person. Not even like Noah. Noah was given an outrageous compliment. Ish, Sadiq, Tamim, perfectly righteous person in his generation. As if to make it to justify God's choice of him. But here, God's choice of Abraham goes unjustified. It's somehow irrational or irrational. So it doesn't seem to have anything to do with something we can link on to. What are we told about him? Two things. One is that his father had started the journey from ur towards Eretz Canaan without any command from God, it seems, of his own accord. But he had not completed the journey. He had stopped in a place called Haran, and the family settled there. So it was an, there was an uncompleted journey behind Abraham. That's what we're being told. There, was, there is a kind of gap in Abraham's history where there should have been the arrival at the place. Instead, he ends up in some place called Haran, but it doesn't, that doesn't satisfy us very much. The other thing we're told about him is that his wife, Sarai, was barren. She didn't have a child. Which means, I suppose, that he didn't have a child. Instead of telling us that clearly, that Avraham doesn't have a child, after all, that's not self-understood. The fact that she was barren doesn't necessarily mean that he doesn't have a child. He could have had another wife or a concubine or... It's the, all we're told is that she doesn't have a child, which is obvious. He says it's, it, it, it's already said she was barren. She was barren, so it's a kind of hammering the point home that Sarai is barren. Maybe, in a way, what the Torah is doing is trying to make us feel that enla, that absence of the child, that absence of, um, what's the word I want? Of fruit, fruit of one's body. The absence of something that was absolutely essential to every human being that ever lived in the world. But what do we have in the the, story, the the list of genealogies between Adam and Noah and between Noah and Avram? Ten generations. What is a generation? A generation is someone who lives his life and produces children. That's a generation. He generates. So everyone is busy generating in the, in the 10 generations from Noah. That's really all we're told about the generations. We're not even told that the person died at a certain age. It's interesting with a change. And all we're told is the number of years he lived until he had a particular child, the important one, the one whose, whose line we're going to follow. And then we're told the number of years he lived after he had that child. And he gave birth to sons and daughters. So if there's one thing the generations are doing, right, they are generating. And here comes Avram, and Avraham can't generate. That's the condition of his life. He married someone, uh, one of the Midrashic understandings of that expression, Ein Lavalad, she didn't have, um, the word is, is escaping me, she didn't have fruit of her body, um, she, uh, uh, one of the understandings of that is she didn't have a womb. In other words, making it absolutely unequivocal. That there can be no way, according to nature, that Abraham and Sarai have children. And so there's something definitive and terribly contingent about it. A feeling of, oh, well, he, found, he married her and then he found out that she didn't have a womb. But that, that's the way it goes. That, that, that's what happens in the world. No particular meaning to it, just that's one of the things that happens with all the anguish that goes along with it. But the Torah doesn't emphasize the am- anguish. It doesn't talk at all about uh, what's missing in Avram's life. It's just that bare fact about his wife. Yeah. So there's one thing that Abraham needs, and God proceeds then to bless Abraham, having made the demand of him, that bare demand, the Eschel Goy Gadol, I'll make you into a great nation, I will bless you, and I will make your name great. That's God's promises. Have a look at Rashi. Rashi says, it'll all be to your good. And then he goes on on the next uh, phrase, I'll make you into a great nation. Why does God promise that to Abraham? Well, I might have thought, because it's obvious that Abraham needs children. So that's the thing, the blessing that Abraham needs. 
But Rashi takes it a little bit differently and says, because going on a journey has, has certain well-known costs to it. Everyone knows that journeys are bad for fertility. Well, I'm not, sure, I'm not so sure I knew that, but apparently that is pretty obvious in the ancient world. If you're traveling, you're not settled and you can't settle down and have a family so easily. It may affect fertility. So if she has fertility problems, she has a, a preceding condition, what do they call it these days? Uh, a, a preceding health condition, then to tell him to travel is actually outrageous. You know, why command him to do something that will make the likelihood of having children even less than it has been? And the other, what, the other two things that traveling is bad for um, is one's financial situation. You don't get a chance really to make money if you're always on the move to, to improve your standing, your financial standing. And the other, the third thing is your reputation, your name. That Hello? Is... Hello. I have something. I think it's yesterday's, but that's okay. I didn't hear all of yesterday's. I'm listening. Can you, can you unmute yourself? Sorry, can you mute yourself? Okay, thank it's a you. Zoom. I have a, she's wearing a white collar and a... Uh... Can you, can you okay. mute I'll yourself? I'll listen to this. This is great. This is great, honey. Thanks a lot. Bye. <laughs> okay. There has to be a funny side to this. Okay. So, traveling is bad for you. And in those three particular areas, fertility, finance, and fame, if you want to call it, you don't get a chance to build up a local reputation, to have to be known as a certain kind of person if you're always on the move. You don't get a chance to build up. A shame, a no, a name. That's the reason that God promises him particularly these three blessings, blessings that have to do with these three areas. As if to say to him, on the one hand, I want you to travel, and on the other hand, I want you to know that you won't pay a price for your travels. On the contrary, in those three areas, paradoxically, right, your life is not going to be rational, but everything that you, f you might feel weak about actually will be that traveling will add strength to you. So it's a kind of calculus here. It'll be for your benefit. A sense here in Rashi's understanding that Abraham's common sense is being appealed to and transcended. God is saying to him, I know these are the things you must be worried about, but in your case, it'll be just the opposite. Then comes, after God's blessing, the promises, comes the Haye Bracha. You shall be a blessing. But it's not you shall be a blessing. It's not a blessing. It's a command. Hey, it's the imperative. So the one imperative, the one command that Abraham is given in this speech of God, in addition to Lech Lecha, get traveling, is be a blessing. Become a blessing. And there's no way of knowing exactly what that means. Be a blessing to the world, perhaps, except that it, God already said that I will make you a blessing. I, I will make you a blessing in the world. Um, so what is it to be the command to become a blessing, a source of blessing? Uh, Rashi, uh, on your source page again in number one, he translates it, he, he, he interprets it as, from now on, you will be the first human being to have the power of blessing others. So the blessings, in, in relation to blessings, you will not just be an object of blessing, Adam was an object of, of God's blessing. Noah was an object of God's blessing. To be an object of God's blessing is very wonderful. It's a real blessing, but it's limited. I am an object. I am, I'm, I'm, I'm inert. I'm just, I'm a kli. I'm, a, I'm a, a vessel that contains blessing. No, what God wants of Abram is more than that. I want you to be a subject of blessing. I want you to be a source of blessing. Through you shall be blessed all the nations of the earth. Now, that, that sense of thing. But if God says that very clearly as a blessing to Abraham, why does he then command them? Be a blessing. So it seems a kind of repetition. So this, the, really the, uh, the agenda of Abraham, what he has to deal with now, facing this journey, is to travel away from everything he knows towards an unknown destination and become a blessing. That's a short story of Abraham's travels, travails. 
the English word travel is connected with the word uh, travel, travailler in French, is both to work and to labor, right? Labor pains, right? also connected with the, the same word. Something has to be born here. Something has to be born. You have to be changed intimately. Something in your very subjectivity, not just the good things of the world will be given to me, all the good things I might want, but actually I will undergo a certain kind of transformation. And that is what the way the Zohar translates, l'cha. So if we're laying the ground now, Rashi has given a kind of pragmatic uh, promise in the word l'cha. Abraham is being promised good things, all the good things in his life that, that every human being wants, perhaps especially Abraham, in relation to children. The Zohar takes it on a different level and says, le, le cha, le cha. I'll translate that for the remaking of you, tikkun. Tikkun is, you use tikkun when you're repairing something. Yes? Tikkunim. That is, there's something wrong, and it needs a repair. And when we talk about tikkun olam, and the, the, way, the ways in which we use the expression, it's a Kabbalistic expression originally, and now we use it in very real, it's used in very real social uh, frameworks, the idea of making the world better, but it's really not just better. There is behind the word tikkun an, a sense of the world being wrong, Something is badly put to, badly put together, and you will be metaken. You will here. It's you that needs a tikkun in the Zohar translation. Now, I'm making it much more blatant than perhaps it is in the original. The tikkun ha or for your transformation, let's say. But I'm pointing out that perhaps what the Zohar is suggesting here is there's something wrong with Avraham's original identity that he has to somewhere reconfigure his identity only then will he be capable of having children so the idea of having children then which is the important blessing it has to go by way of a transformation in Abraham himself as he is he will never have to so as opposed to Rashi who makes it a matter of travel, and there you will have children. When you arrive at your destination and have children, here you will never have children. The difference is for Rashi, the difference between the beginning of the journey and the end of the journey. When you get there, you will have children. In the Zohar's understanding, the main thing is something that has to be started right away. And the journey will help you do it, the journey itself. And that has to do with dealing with something broken, yeah, and, and, and I'm over-reading, but something that needs tikkun, as if, and I'll translate it now into psychoanalytic language, as if there is some kind of a trauma in Avraham's background that he himself is not entirely aware of. And God is saying to him, I need you out of your background I need you to detach yourself from everything, from the envelope of your being, all the places of your being, shinui makon, as the Midrash puts it. You have to dis erect, I say, unroot yourself from your roots in your background and go rootless, go trailing your, your old roots somewhere, leaving them behind perhaps, until you find another makom. And I'm not telling you which direction to go in. I'm not telling you, giving you any information other than leave where you were. Because there's something about where you were that, was, that needs unrooting. Somewhere you need to cut off that, that root. Now that's quite a, quite a serious demand. Have a look at how Rashi talks about Go to the land which I will show you. Lo gilalo ha'aretz miyad. It's the end of number one. Or perhaps you should look at the, 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 the paragraph before. When, when God says, leave your country, the obvious objection is, well, his father had already left their country, broadcasting. 
And God means broadcasting. With the place where you were born, Molad Etzacha. Molad. So what you have here then is that his father has already left that place. So why does God now tell Abraham, leave your country? Clearly, it doesn't mean the geographical, purely geographical departure. As Rashi says, Hitrachek od misham. Go even further away than your father did. So it's a question of putting distance between you and something in your background that is in you, but has to be addressed out of context. That is, not, while you're still in your background, you will never pay attention to what it is in you that is causing you trouble, that's causing you pain. And that's the nature of trauma. In the modern um, psychoanalytic understanding of the word, trauma is not just having had a painful event in one's youth and one's childhood. That's not sufficient to call it trauma. Trauma is a forgotten event. It's an event that was so terrible, that affected you so deeply, that you can't bear to think about it. Right? That's a psychoanal- it's repressed, as the psychoanalysts like to say. You've pushed it down so that you can't think of it. And I'm suggesting that there's something like this is suggested here about Abraham. There's something we're not think about, thinking about here. It's there. We could, if we only used our imagination, perhaps, a little bit. If only we, we worried about a certain turbulence in the air, a certain turbulence that was raised in the original description of Abraham. Part of it is the fact that he doesn't have children in among everybody else who has children. You know, what is this? What does that indicate in, in some sense? The other thing is, and I won't talk about this obvious source of trauma this week. I'm going to come to it next week. The real plot, seems to me, is in that mysterious story about how Abraham's brother dies in the presence, in the lifetime of his father. Doesn't seem to belong to Abraham's story in any relevant way. He had a brother called Haran, and Haran died while his, his own father was still alive. That's something unnatural. That's a turbulence in history. Um, the, the British, uh, one of the early British uh, psychoanalysts, Wilfred Bryan, has a wonderful passage in which he talks about how when you listen to the radio, presumably in the, we're talking here about the 19, 19, very early actually, the Second World War, around the Second World War. Um, when you listen to the radio and you're trying to listen to something beautiful by Bach and Mozart, and there's a lot of interference in the, in the broadcast. So the normal, healthy, you might say, uh, reaction of the listener is, to try not to listen to the interference and to get to listen to Bach and Mozart. You listen to the beauty and you're not interested in, in all that stuff that's going on there. That's a disruption of some kind, interference. But there are some people who will be interested, Dafka, by the interference. What, what's, what's going on there? And in the end, there will be people who build huge uh, radio telescopes in order to pick up the interference in space and come to all kinds of huge conclusions about what there really is there that was otherwise not, not, not noticeable. It takes a certain respect for, Byron says, it takes a certain respect for the human mind to notice that there are interferences, there are things there that could be thought about, could pay attention to that, and not do the obvious thing of suppressing them getting rid of them because I'm, I know what I'm interested in. I'm interested in the beauty. And here now, certainly in trauma studies, there is an idea, strange idea, that it might be a good idea to think about those indications of trouble. And that's what I want to pick up here. Um, if we look at uh, the, at the end of number one, and then we'll, we'll really start moving. I share our echo. We'll go to the land which I will show you. God did not reveal to him what land it was immediately. In order to make it precious to him. That is, it's like I'm not telling you your destination so that you will wonder about it and you will enjoy the curiosity and the 
and the mystery of not knowing where you're going. Maybe you'll speculate about it. Somewhere your mind will become active and create a kind of attachment to the place you're going without knowing the name of the place. If you know the name of the place, in a way, that's the end of wonder. On the other hand, it's also the end of anxiety. Once you know the name of the place, that's surely a good thing. Surely, if you don't know where you're going, and it's a difficult journey, it's a risky, difficult journey, as journeys are at the assumption, then you would, it would make you feel much more anxious not to know the name of the place. So that Abraham will get reward for every single debord, debord, de, everything that's said about his destination. Is it this? Is it that? All that will give him reward because it will in some way expand his own processes. It's not just a matter of I'm putting you on a train and you get off and this will be, um, this will be Haifa. Perfectly. You know exactly where you're going. In which case you can sleep the whole journey, emotionally speaking. Here, Abraham is asked to remain alert. Is it this? Is it this? The kind of, in a way, a kind of a state of constant discomfort that God wants of him. So he doesn't reveal right away. And later on at the end of his life, God will again say lech lecha to him. And in this case, it will be for the Akedah. That will be the, the end of Abraham's life. And there too, God will not tell him right away what he's, who he's talking about. Take your son, your only one, the one you love. Now, all these are, they're torment. All these, all these words, I would say, are torment. Why not just tell Abraham right away, take Yitzchak? But it's only after all these words, as if what God wants on both ends, you know, both end pieces of Abraham's life, in the, in the, in the journey and in the Akedah, what God wants of Abraham is to be fully awake. Air. To be fully awake, even if it's uncomfortable. To notice all the possible things he might be thinking. My son, but I love them both, and so on. Yeah? To have all the human responses. Not to be somehow knocked on the head and say, well, it's your suck. That he should live through a certain process. It's a cruel proceeding. But it's one, apparently, that is connected with the remaking of Abraham. Right? Therapies, self-transformation self therapies have something cruel about them. There's no question about it. They demand a certain kind of awareness, not being too rooted in one place, being free to think, being free to consider possibilities. And so with this, I want to go to to the first medrash that I want to put on the table. Um, yes, you can read Ramban for yourself. Uh, let me just point out on the way in number two, uh, the last phrase in number two, that Abraham, in the, in the time that he was traveling, and it was quite a long time, according to Ramban, in the Torah, it takes seven verses till he arrives, but it could have been years. Hayatoe kase ovid. And Ramban uses an emotional image here to describe Abraham as traveling like a lost lamb. Now, we weren't really thinking very much about Abraham's travels. Right? Before you came into his class, <laughs> perhaps he went, never thought about it very much. All right, so God told him to go, and seven verses later he arrived. No, says Ramban, you have to understand that from his subjective point of view, this was an endless journey, and he was vulnerable and lost. Ramban is here quoting, uh, referring to a verse in the book of Psalms, the last psalm, actually, uh, 150, I think, yes, um, where the psalmist says, Ta'iti I've been wandering like a lost lamb. Please, God, find me. You can see the map. I can't see the map, and I'm just, I'm just blundering around. I'm not sure at any moment where I am, and if this is the place, right? I'm always full of questions. And that's one of the cries of the psalmist. And so Ramban is calling on that, and he wants to give us something of that sense of the life of a religious, a religious human being 
who has not found total security. And that, in a way, is a factor of his religiousness. That is the most important fact for me to know about. But he's not comfortable. It's not a situation of comfort. And he cries out to God for help. That, that's that's the, the, religious, the religious posture, if you will. To other people, he looks simply crazy. Before we go into the Midrash now, let me just add this one floating Midrash that I have in my mind. Um, people look at him and they say, Piruza Kenze, look at this old man. Right? They regard he's an old man. He's traveling and he doesn't know where he's going. Have you ever seen he looks like a Meshuga? Near a Kemo Meshuga. He looks like Meshuga means crazy. But the root of the word actually means, shogea, means to travel in all different directions, right? To stumble around in all different directions, not to have a firm core, not to know exactly how everything works in yourself. And that is somewhere, that's the way he looks to other people. How does he feel in himself? And the Midrash now is interested in Avraham as a subject, not just in let's get the journey over and let's, let's have him arrive, in, in, in the promised land. It's, let's see what it's like to be promised and unpromised. To have a land promised to you, but not a land that you can even hold firmly in your mind. That you don't really know where you're going. What's it like to be that? And here we look at number three. This is the first Midrash, uh, in the Midrash Rabbah on Lech Lecha. God said to Avram, Lech Lecha. Get going from your land. Go to yourself. Rabbi Yitzchak opened up. And he starts by quoting another quotation, another proof text from the book of Psalms. And he brings the two quotations up against each other. Lech Lecha on the one hand. On the other hand, Shim Bat Uri'i, listen, O daughter, and see, open up your senses. Vahati Oznech, and incline your ear, so open up your senses, listen, see, hear, v'shikhi amech v'tavich, and forget your people of origin and your, the house of your father. It sounds a little reminiscent, right? We can hear the resonance, leave your land and the house of your father. What is l'cha? Open up your senses. Go to yourself means open up all your unused faculties. As if now you have to become alert because you're going to be leaving everything. This is, in the book of Psalms, this is a young bride who is being described uh, as she begins her, her wedding journey to go and meet her unknown husband. She has never met him. He is the one she is, is destined to. And in some sense, then, the, uh, the psalm is addressing a classic situation, and certainly in the ancient world and in the medieval world, and maybe sometimes in the modern world, some parts of the world as well, where the bride has not met the bridegroom. And if she's an aristocratic young lady, the match is made, and she travels without sight unseen as a very young girl into a world that she has no real way of imagining. She doesn't know what marriage is in any real sense, and she doesn't know who he is. And that's the verse that is now brought into play. Amar Rabbi Yitzchak. What is this like? Avraham is like a young bride who's going off into the unknown. And once you use that image of the bride, then you have to, your imagination start working. I don't have to spell it out. Leave your father's, forget all about your father's house. The way you knew love, the way you knew attachment, it's not useful for you to carry that with you. You need now to move into a different gear, into a different modality. Move into something you, hard for you to imagine. There's almost an Oedipal theme there. Leave your attachment to your father. Go off now to the husband. What is this like, asks W. So There's a kind of second level of, of parable. There was someone, Echad, Shehaya Over Mimakom Mimakom, who was traveling from one place to another. That's a traveler, from one makom to another makom, constantly changing his makom. That's what travelers do. Why would anyone in his senses do that? 
unless you have a destination that you're aiming for, and you have to pass through all these places on the way. But in his case, he doesn't know where he's going. So it's if each place becomes his place for a moment, and then he moves on. That's what it means to be Ivri. Avraham Ivri. This is the dark side of what it means to be Avraham Ivri. It means to be constantly in transit. To be this and this. Makom is a place of being. Kiyum. This one? No. On. Next one? No. So no wonder he looks crazy because it seems as if there's something experimental going on. He's asking himself impossible questions all the time. Is this the place? Is this the place? No one else is asking such questions. Everyone is where they are. And then he saw a certain castle on fire, Bira Doleket. That is a very famous midrash. He sees a, a castle on fire. He says, Tomar, would you say, now that way of beginning is very eloquent. He asks himself a question. For instance, it's as if he's in the middle of some stream of consciousness. He's thinking, and he says, oh, you know what? Would you say this? Who's he talking to? Would you say that this castle has no one in charge? Below Mantik. Why does he raise that hypothesis? Because it's burning to the ground, and no one seems to be interested. No one seems to be doing anything about it. So it looks like an abandoned castle, and he is very upset about it. And he says, would you say... Now, what is the effect of that, would you say? He could just have cried out, no one's here, no one's in charge. Instead, he raises it as a plausible interpretation of reality. Any sensible person might say this, that there's no one in charge. But it's clear that the question disturbs him a great deal. He doesn't want to accept it himself. Would you say? Yes, you could say that very, very plausibly. The truth is that there are two different, let's just think in the plot and to make it even more difficult. That castle on fire becomes, in a different interpretation, a castle that's fully lit, lit up. All the lights are on in the castle. That's an alternative reading. In which case, our traveler looks at it and thinks, could you possibly say that there's no one in charge here? No, of course not. Someone, someone's clearly there. Someone's in residence. That would be one way of asking the question, which would then lead Avraham to ask about who is in charge. Now, obviously, the analogy is who's in charge of the world that's so beautifully lit, in which everything is so beautifully fitting with everything else. You can, you can sense there's someone in charge. So that would be perhaps the response of a philosopher who manages like Aristotle, perhaps, or like Ram, the Rambam's Avraham, we'll see that in just a moment, who manages to arrive at a positive theological conclusion about the world all on his own, just by looking at the beautiful, logical way the world works and asking certain questions about it until he arrives at the truth there must be someone in charge. But the castle on fire is just the opposite. And that's the one that's the more dynamic way of reading the, the story. The castle on fire indicates that there's no one in charge. And Abraham cries out here, is it possible? Would you say that? As if the question arises from some strange place inside him. It's not, not really he who's asking the question. Hitzitz Alav Barabira, the owner of the castle, peers out at him. Hitzitz, at Satsa. It's like a, 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 gl a glimpse, a glance. It's a spark, sets. a spark of a glance, and says to him, Anihu Balhabira, I am the owner of the castle. In other words, God introduces himself and says, mm -hmm, you know, kind of, here I am. He doesn't explain anything. Why is the castle burning? You know, what, why don't I do anything about it? He doesn't answer any questions, but there is an encounter in response to the traveler's question. So with Avraham, Avraham Avinu, he said he looked at the world on fire, and it's a very strong image. The world burning up, burning up in greed and lust and hatred and, and so on and so on and so on, uh, destroying itself, as it were. And he asked, 
is anyone in charge of this world? And he asks it in the rhetorical question mode. Would you say that there's this hypothetical person who's being evoked here? Not me. Would you say that? And the answer, obviously, is yes. There is no one in charge. But Abraham is in turmoil about it. He's in some kind of question. He raises it as a question. He's not, it's not resolved. And so God settles him down somewhat by saying, here I am, without any explanation. So there's something almost absurd about this scenario. Here I am. All you have is the bare encounter. Something comes across. There is a revelation that comes through God's eye glance. That he is, his, his eyes meet Abraham in some sense. And then having got that far with a, a parable, then we return to the original Midrash about the bride, about the traveling princess. The verse in the Psalms continues there. Uh, leave, leave, forget your father and mother, open up your own senses. And, let the, and the king will desire your beauty, for he is your Adonai. Well, I have to translate that, state that he is your Lord. Not, not very appealing, but he, he will be your Lord and master. Right? In a traditional society, that's the way of it. You leave your father's house and you marry your husband. And he will desire your beauty. A strange verse for the Midrash to incorporate to help us with Abraham, to explain Abraham to us. Abraham, who is clearly not female. There is no way that Abraham is female. It's Abraham Avinu. His, his maleness, his, his potential for procreating is, is at the center of the story. He's going to be of Hamun Goyim. He's going to be the father of many nations. All right? So his masculinity is very important. And here, without any, without blinking an eyelid, the Midrash gives us an analogy with a woman whose beauty is the issue, a beauty whose meaning is unknown to her at this moment in her life. That is, she comes from a background in which her beauty was irrelevant, whatever beauty means, if we try to think of Avraham. And it will be very relevant that she will discover eros. The erotics lies in front of her. And it's something that can't be told to her before it happens. That is, there's no way she can expect it and prepare for it. It's just a sense of there is another life. There's a transfigured life ahead of me, and I'm asked to move towards it with all my senses in some way, pared down to the quick. You know, that now I'm really noticing things. I'm beginning to know what I'm leaving and what I'm, in my own mind perhaps, moving towards. And that is to move, and, 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 and the Midrash then comments on the king desiring the beauty, the end of the Midrash there, le yapoter ba'olam. The, the king desires to make you beautiful in the world. That is, what God wants of Abraham is not his beauty, but he wants that Abraham should have a beauty that will be perceived by the whole world. But Abraham, why bring beauty into Abraham? Why not talk about wisdom? That you will have, you will be, a, your wisdom will affect the world. And here, for the sake of contrast, let's look at the Rambam, number five. The Rambam very famous passage in Hilchot Avodat Kochavim, gives us the background of Abraham. The question that we wanted to know, we wanted answered. But who was Abraham before God said to him, Lech Lecha? Why did God choose him? And so on. Revelation, when, when, when moments of revelation come, does it not matter at all who is the receiver of the revelation? The receiver is completely passive, inert, nothing to do. Right? We don't need to know anything about him. He's just a, a vessel that God comes and pours his, his, his wisdom into. Surely it can't be like that. And so the Rambam gives Abraham a very highly specific background. And as I hinted before, it's similar to the Aristotelian idea of the growth of the philosopher. How the philosopher begins to work things out in his own mind and realizes, in Abraham's case, from a very early age. Ramban said he was still katan. 
he was just being weaned. Kevan shenigmal etanze. It's quite picturesque that this giant, this person who will become a, a giant in history, started off as a baby, and when he, as he was being weaned, he was already starting wandering in his mind. He was already starting roaming a certain journey, internal journey, an intellectual journey began in his mind at age three. Right? That's one of the the um, the guesses about how old he was, but he started a process. And it may have been from three to 40. That's one of the frameworks that's given in certain sources. By the time he reached 40, says the Rambam, he had worked it all out. And he knew that God is the one who makes everything go round. Like Aristotle's prime mover, the original moving force, the outside force, that makes all the inside rings go around right, in, the, in the world of the spheres. You need a prime mover, and that's God. We call it God. Aristotle called it the, the, the prime mover. And clearly, Rambam is incorporating Aristotle here into his ideal image of Abraham, that he was the person who worked out while he was still living among those stupid idolaters. Rambam doesn't spare his words about those stupid, unaware idolaters who are worshipping idols and to think that every idol is worth worshipping, who think that's what explains the world. And Avram, from the beginning, was pursuing his own thoughts, not knowing where he would arrive, that's open-ended, but somewhere pursuing a process of logic and clear thought till he arrived at the truth. If you read the passage for yourself, you'll see how it's very clear there is one truth. And he is so effective in propagating his truth, in teaching it to people, particularly through debates. He would have debates, individual debates with people, like Plato, Plato's dialogues. That was his way of that's his way of convincing the world of his truth. Purely rational, purely argumentative. Each, each person individually, uh, uh, Abraham would ask him a question, like Plato. And he would somehow or argue him into a corner until uh, the poor man realized that he had to thought it through properly and he had to, uh, had to accept Abraham's logic. Uh, that process led to him becoming very successful and also very feared in his society, like Plato, uh, like Socrates, actually, like Socrates. And in the end, Socrates, it comes to a very bad end. The Socrates is executed because he's regarded as uh, undermining the beliefs of society, as a, as a, as a, as a, as a dissident, as a, re a rebel. Abraham has a happier end. Even so, he is thrown into a pit, the Lambam says, or into a fiery furnace of some kind, evoking a midrash that I don't want to deal with at this, at this moment. But by miracle, he was saved, and then he went on his travels. There is no moment at which God says to him, Lech Lecha in the Rambam's account. He, go, he leaves the land he was in because it was a land of persecution. It was a land in which people were not, were not able to hold him, were not able to, to bear what he, the news he had to bring. And he went to better territory. He traveled then through all kinds of areas in which he became a successful traveling teacher, traveling lecturer uh, to thousands and tens of thousands of people were affected by him. Right? So it's kind of almost realistic description of who Abraham was in the ancient world, a kind of historical description. Um, but it was all done face to face, one on one. He would enter all those hundreds of thousands of people. It wasn't a general lecture, but he would enter into real argument of each person and convince each person of the power and 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 and, and the, the, the the fact that God is created the world and is behind the world. Each person, according to his capacity, and if you look there at the end, he implanted in them the great principle of the one God. Implanted within them is not by hypnosis; it's by a rational argument. In other words, if we go back to our to our midras. Nothing to do with beauty, everything to do with wisdom. Everything to do with cleverness, with wisdom, and with an ability 
to persuade people around to your way of thinking. Rationality. In the Midrash, on the other hand, and the, and the Midrash much predates the Rambam. I think uh, from, from the Rambam's point of view, Midrash is, has a rather dubious quality to it. What you have is the erotic. Avraham persuading, not by reason, but by the power of his beauty. That in some sense, he affects people as, as beauty affects people. And that's what it means then to, when, 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 when God says, uh, I will make your name great, it has something to do with an erotic connection between Avraham and the people, uh, in, the people of of his world. And in the Midrash, it has something to do with a bride who is obviously being faced with a kind of intimate turmoil in her existence. That something is going to 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 disrupt her calm existence as as a child as she grows into a self that she has no way of framing clearly ahead of time. So there is a certain element, I think it's an important element, that can't be disregarded about anxiety that the Midrash wants to even, which is not there in the Rambam's very reassuring, solid, logical description of the growth of an intellectual genius. Unless one actually reads biographies of intellectual geniuses, it just occurs to me now. People who become known as geniuses, are they people who just build solidly one step upon the other on things they know? I would say absolutely not. But the truth is, is rather the opposite. That the genius is the person who is constantly having to question what every, everyone else accepts, who is constantly compelled in some way to go beyond any particular place of rest, and so, there's like a restlessness and a discomfort in the life of the genius, intellectual or not, which has to do with lack of confidence, of not being so sure one is right, and wondering which way to go. Certainly when it comes to the kind of genius, like I think Abraham is most like, and that is the artistic genius. Someone who doesn't work on the frame of logic, but on the frame of something else, of what is not yet known. And what I want to do from this point forward is to take you through a couple of Midrashic sources that use very powerful and suggestive imagery to give us a sense of what it means, lech lecha, to go towards a self that I'm waiting to meet. I'm waiting to meet that 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 what is at the moment only potential, that myself at the moment is a kind of rough sketch of what will yet evolve. And one knows it oneself. It's not just other people. All that one knows is one that, is that one hasn't arrived. And in some way, perhaps one may not arrive. What we're doing then is to evoke what we now call the unconscious. What is there in one that leads one when one doesn't know. Something unknown in oneself. Have a look now at number six. This is the Mea Shiloh, the Ishbitzer, late 19th century master, Hasidic master, and commentary on the Torah, on the word Lech Lecha. We keep coming back to the same problem. What is Lech Lecha? Who was Avraham? When God said to him, Lech Lecha, what did it mean to say Lech Lecha to him? Did it just mean that Abraham heard words from, from the heavens one day saying Lech Lecha? <laughs> That's like the last thing any of these sources want to contemplate. It's not like that. It's, that's not the way it happens. So what do we have here? Ki etzak, quotation from Isaiah, Yeshayahu. Ki etzak mayim al when I pour out water on thirsty ground, the nozlim al yivasha, and liquids on dry land, dried up territory. Something here about a godly blessing of rain, of liquid, on thirsty dry ground. 
uh, you may remember that last week, the existence of rain, the existence of water, had everything to do with the story of the flood, right? too much water, mabul ma'im, and then going back to the creation of, of Adam, that Adam was made by a combination of earth and water. You couldn't make Adam if it, out of dry earth. It, he had to have water to be worked with, so that it's possible to, to knead the dough, yeah, which creates Adam. And here now you have a verse on the words lech lecha, go to yourself. It's like the, the meeting of wet and dry. Uh, the gratitude with which the dry earth accepts the water. Uh, we're thinking in terms of imagery here. Once you put the two together, you can't just think the dry earth is inert. The dry earth is drinking up the water, as we say. So there's some activity going on in the recipient of that water, of that moisture. And then the Isbeter begins his story. When Abraham began to seek and to quest after the root of his own life. And that's the way that Abraham's journey is now described. Not lech lecha, but a quest that he began by himself. To look for, to look for what? It's not called Eretz Canaan. It's called the root of his own life. This rootless person, this Ariri person who can't have a child, who comes from a background that we know very little about and who's asked to detach himself from that background. This Ariri, this rootless person is looking for a root, looking for the root of life. Um, after he had already understood, having thought things through and felt things, he realized that all the desirable things of this world, all the good things of this world cannot be called true life. Now, that's not an intellectual process. It's a man looking for a root. It's not trying to find the sphere that moves all spheres. It's looking internally, intimately into oneself and not finding an, ex an explanation for one's being. I don't find a way of making sense of my own being. Right? And he decides that all the blessings, quote unquote, of the world are not the answer because that's not life. You know, wealth and fame and, and so on and so on. All of these things are not life itself. Perhaps even having a child, I, mean, I don't know how that fits in here, but uh, I really just don't know. But call him dad or all the normally desirable things of this world. The, the best you can say about all these things is, yeah, it's good to have money so that you won't have to have the discomfort of being poor. Right? To remove the discomforts and the interruptions, the things that interrupt your life, it's good to have enough money to, to create a zone of comfort around yourself. But in itself, that's not life. Money is not life. Everything is not... Everything, all obvious blessings are not life. What then is guf hachayim? What can that be? And when he's asking that question to himself, then God says to him, lecha, lech lecha. Don't look outside yourself for all the things in the world. They can't be called life. Look inside yourself. Ikar hachayim timsa lecha. You will find it in yourself. The Bashem. Quoting Isaiah again, Yeshayahu, you are the one who will rejoice in God. You will rejoice in God, usually read God. God will be the one that you will rejoice in. But the Ishbitzer is reading, there will be a you to rejoice in God. When when how will you come to recognize that the real the real place to look for answers to your questions, is not out there, but in here. Like in that unknown territory of the mind, and I mean my mind, I don't mean intellectual mind, about how one's inner world works. When, when that, that go into yourself. And this is like the Midrash. Um, he goes on to quote the Midrash that we saw about the owner of the castle. He cheats I love Bal Habira, we work with. The owner of the castle, you remember, glanced at him and said, I'm the owner of the castle. And here the 
the uh, Mer Shiloh um, is very daring. He says, God glanced not at him, that should be Elav, Hetzit Elav. Allah means God trained his gaze upon Abraham. As it were, to say to Abraham, Halo Tireb Asmacha. Look at you. I'm looking at you. You look at you. Yes. Uh, there is a there is a, a, a figure in, in philosophy where you, you talk about someone who points his finger. You point your finger. You want people to look at where you're pointing. You don't want people to look up your arm. You know, when you point your finger. All right. It's a code. I'm pointing. I want you to look at the end of my finger. Here, God is pointing his gaze at Abraham. And he wants Abraham reflexively to realize that that's where he has to be looking. Not looking for God out there in things, but inside in the unknown world that there is inside him. It sees Alaf. And what was the issue here? He sees, the Ishbister picks up a, a Midrashic theme here that says that what he was looking at, that the burning castle, was indeed the burning world at the time of the Tower of Babel. The last story before Abraham. When the whole tower was endangered by fire. Everyone is it's complete confusion. No one understands who, uh, no one understands um, anyone else's language. Right? The people are there. People are killing each other. There's a state of absolute chaos. It's called like like a burning castle. We didn't mention a fire in the story there, Kifshan um, Haesh. And Avraham is now told to engage with the wonder of the turmoil in his own mind. But here in Binashok, that Avraham is looking at the world burning up and is not so much surprised at the world as surprised to notice I am the only one who seems to notice the fact that the world is burning up. Why is it that no one else is crying out? Why is no one else protesting at the ownerless world, at the world that's so crazy that it seems as if no one's in charge. Right? That's an outrage on more than one level. And Abraham's inner world is in turmoil. God says to him, you see, you are the only one. It's only in your eyes that this is amazing. That, 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 that this, this is, this is, this is, this is what you are looking at draws your, your turbulent attention. From the turmoil in your own heart, you should be able to work out, to think about how surely there is a creator who created everything and is in everything. And this creator aroused your heart, your inner world, to this kind of consciousness. That is, where do you find evidence of God? Not in the burning world. The burning world, if you are an aware person, arouses in you a certain agitation that responds, a feeling of being lost, a feeling of I, I'm not comfortable in the world. I'm not comfortable in myself. I don't find in myself answers. All I find is outrage at the world. And then I look at other people and I see that everyone is in perfect comfort, it seems. Everyone's just, the world carries on. And why do I have this inside me? That's my clue to God. That is the hint of God's presence, of God's reality, is my capacity for discomfort. For my capacity for feeling not at home in the world. Now, that is seen as the seed, right? The root, in the, to use his expression. The root of the experience of this people, of Abraham and his children, of our root, of our experience in the world. That is a drop of water on dry territory from which things can grow. That will affect Abraham's children and children's children forever. That they too will inherit some of this uneasiness in the world. Why am I like I am? Right? Now, if you've grown up in a, if you've grown up in a very settled society, let's say a settled religious society, then you may never have asked that question. Or you may have asked, asked, asked that question. Why am I different from everyone else? If you grow up in the unsettled world, in the world that's full of 
unanswered questions. Then you can still ask yourself, why am I so troubled by the state of things? After all, why don't I just take it as a given? No one is in charge, right? I don't expect better of the world. There is no one in charge, and therefore, you know, each person eats each other alive. You know, that's, 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 that's the way it is. But I seem to have this strange mixture of discomfort that's uncomfortable about itself, but I'm looking for an answer in spite of it. Now, that is the Ishbitzer with his reading on Lech Lecha. Go and become aware of that inner world in which there is only a sense of unanswered questions and of discomfort about about who I am and why I am. Um, And the question itself, as you see at the end there, the question itself becomes in itself an answer to Abraham. That is, he begins to see himself. He begins to be aware of himself and how the question has the power in it to generate answers. Look now at number seven. Here, the same question. Lech lecha. What is lecha? And this is the next Midrash in Midrash Rabbah. Rabbi Brachia opened up and quoted from Shira Shirin, the Song of Songs. Lereach shmanecha tovim. Your oils are, are finely fragrant. Shemen turak shemecha. Your, your name is like decanted fragrant oil. A way of describing the beauty and the beautiful effect of the beloved. The lover is praising the beloved by how, how, how wonderful perfume that affects the world in a certain, in a certain way. Who is this about? Who are we really talking about here? And this is one of the classic applications of this verse. It's brought home to Avraham. Avraham is Avraham is the perfume. Avraham Namahaya Dome, Mitzlochit Shell, Apopil Simon, Apopil Simon, Mukefet Samid Patil. Like a flask of fine oil, balsam, balsamic oil, fragrant oil, tightly enclosed in a bottle. In other words, well corked and stable so it doesn't move around. As long as it's totally stable, corked up, its fragrance doesn't waft out into the world. But as soon as it begins to be mital telet, that's the wonderful word I want to focus on here, tiltul, which means disturbed, deranged, right, restless, moved around, agitated, Opened up, obviously, it always includes me, but uncorked. And then, like the ladies of the sales, the sales ladies in the store, you know, one of the things they do ostentatiously is just sort of wave the perfume around so the air is full, full of this precious perfume. A little drop of it, right? It's hardly anything in this tiny little, but I think, I think the perfume that's being talked about here is not a, a big jar of, um, of toilet water, you know? It's precious essence. And that essence is moved around restlessly, unhappily in a way. Then its fragrance diffuses. As Haya Recho no death. So God said to Abraham, Taltel atzmacha mi makom le makom. Lech lecha. It's really quite wonderful. What is lech lecha? What the Midrash is picking up here is partly just the sound of the words. Lech lecha. As if God is saying to Abraham, lech lech. Tell tale. It's not the simple root lech, and it's not the simple root tol, take. It's tell tale. Tell tale means when you you double the root like that, say you double a two-letter root like that, you get a four-letter root. It means a kind of agitated, sort of aimless, disturbing motion. 
It's disturbing. It's anxious. But it also allows fragrance to be released into the world. Something about the essence of you will start working like perfume. As long as you're static and stable and totally at home in your place, you will have no effect on the world. It's a challenging midrash because, you know, a lot of pop psychology is about finding comfort, finding, 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 connecting with yourself and, and feeling comfortable with yourself and so on, which is not to say that that's wrong. But that's, much, that's to simplify the, the, the question entirely. And here the midrash makes it complicated. That's what's called taltel. Taltel is to make things complicated, to notice the interference. And to say, what I really, what I'm being told here is, lech, lech. doesn't really matter where you're going, in a sense. Just go, go, go. Because then something will develop out of you, which will attract people. It will make people aware of the beauty of what you are saying to them. Not just like wisdom that convinces. It's wisdom that enchants on some level. You will be, you'll be sowing sowing evocations in the world, intonations in the world. You'll be finding a way of suggesting to people something about God that can't be conveyed by Aristotle, and by the purely logical thinker who's got it all worked out. What is God's effect in the world? If you look at a God-possessed person, a person for whom God is a reality, even if not always a peaceful reality, then something speaks and may speak to you and may, may, may make you speak in some way. And that is to be Abraham's power. Now, for this midrash, then, it's a, it's a very dynamic midrash. It's saying the thing is not to force feed people with the theology of the one God. That's not, that never works. Not really. The thing is for you to spark off in them desire to make them desire your beauty, right? In a sense that, you know, you can sense where this is going. It won't be direct love of you. It will be love of the speaking you, the you that is dealing with God, for whom God is part of, part of a living world, Chayim, as, as the Ishbetzer says, your life. And you only have that experience and have that effect if you move around, tell it. That's, that's one powerful and unexpected image. Then we go to one more, since our time is getting short. Um, look now at number eight. Here, things get closer to the bone. The Midrash begins, still on the words Lech Lecha, by quoting from a Pasuk in Tehillim, moment. Um. Yes, in the hidden. To you is the dew of your youth, Tau. Now, instead of Tiltul, which is moving around, agitation, we have now the simple word Tau. Dew. Very simple. Dew is very simple. Dew is, can be a drop. You know, the little drops of dew that you see on the, on the leaves in the morning. And the Pasuk says, the verse says, to you belongs the dew of your youth. What, what are we going to do with that? Because Abraham, our father, was mitpached. He was in a state of anxiety. And we keep coming back to Avraham in a state of anxiety, asking himself questions. Tomar, would you say, right? This question also begins with Tomar. Would you say, is this a way of looking at things? A voice from inside him that suggests this. Sheyesh biyadi avon, that I have sin in myself. I hold a certain trauma of sin in myself because I worshipped idols all those years at the beginning of my life. Now suddenly there's something, a very concrete suggestion that Abraham is painfully aware that he began his life as an idol worshiper. 
And this is a fact that he could easily have forgotten because he's so much praised for having followed God, that he found God and followed God and he became the father of the Jewish people, that we tend to forget. And maybe he could have been forgiven for forgetting. But actually what this means is not just that he found God, but that he had once been an idol worshiper. And that's what we say on the Seder night. What do we say on the Seder night? Of de avodah zara hayu avoteya, our fathers were, were were idol worshippers. That's what it means to begin the story of the Jewish people. You begin the story. What is, how does how does the bright side put it in uh, in Pesachim? You begin this story. <coughs> Excuse me. Of the Jewish people and of the Exodus from Egypt, you begin it with Gnut. You don't start with salvation. You begin with the stigma. You begin with the unhappy beginning of the story. There was a traumatic beginning in which you were an idol worshiper. Before you broke those idols, according to that story, and that legend Midrash about Abraham, they broke his father's idols. There was a time before that. Yeah, the turbulence that I've been talking about. That, at that time, he bought the whole thing. Obviously, he liked it on some level, except that he didn't in the end. In the end, he no, he decided no. And Abraham is worried by that now. He says, but that also is part of me then. Is it possible that I have to worry? I really have to worry about that, that I'm carrying sin around with me. After all, as the psychoanalysts like to say, nothing you've ever experienced has disappeared. Right. It's all there inside you. Either you're attending to it or you're not attending to it. Or you found some way of metabolizing. You found some way of transforming it. But it's there. And so Abraham is worried here. And God's answer to him is, yours is the due of your youth. It belongs to you. Lecha. The word lecha is the connection with lech lecha. That God is saying to Abraham, the dew of your youth, that is, the idol worship of your youth, own it. Take it, own it as part of yourself. Become aware of it. Yes, that was part of you. That was an important part of your history. Otherwise, there's no way you can understand how you developed. Now, how did you become the you you are now, and how are you going to go on developing? There has to be a kushiyah as Rafutner calls it. There has to be a sense of gnut. There has to be a sense of something difficult and anxiety-provoking about where I come from. That there are elements, there's interference in the story. And then that gives me a certain kind of energy, perhaps, to deal with the interference, yeah, to try to understand something about it and, and, and deal with it. So what do we have here? Just as this view, so the Midrash tries to explain what view has to do with it. Just as this view evaporates, poreach, flies off. It's there for a moment and it flies off. So your sins evaporate. Strange thing to say. I didn't know sins evaporate. They're there and then they go. Just as this dew is a sign of blessing to the world, it is a, right? We actually make, uh, it's one of the important blessings of the year, the, 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 the blessing of dew. So you are a sign of blessing to the world. Lecha tal And there the sins have disappeared. Right? The, the, the ultimate trans, transfiguration of you will be a sign of blessing. <coughs> As things get more emotional, my, my voice ceases up. Okay, so what, what do we have here then? Have a look at uh, number nine, and then we'll look at the Shem Shmuel in number 10, by way of finishing. On the way to number 10, we, we'll look at this passage in the Gemara in Tanit. What about you? What kind of an image is this for sin? That you, you had a sinful period, but it evaporated like dew. Now, what does that tell us? It doesn't tell us anything other than some kind of magical uh, theme. I don't think we're looking for that. It'll just vanish. 
And so here is the Talmud about due, about asking for due. Israel asked for something inappropriate. They really didn't know what they were asking for. But God responded with an appropriate blessing. He edited Israel's request. Israel asked, this is all in the book of Hosea, chapter 6, let us know and pursue to the knowledge of God, whose coming forth is as sure as the dawn. That is, let us look for the sure, clear uh, revelation of God. Let's find God. And let him come as rain to us. Let him come and flood us with water so that we can be fruitful and blessed. God then says, my daughter, to Israel, uh, daughter, you're asking for something that is sometimes desirable and sometimes not desirable. For instance, in summer, perhaps. In summer, you don't want rain. That's not what you want. Right. In winter, it's the appropriate lesson. I'll give you something that is always desirable, God says. And what is that? Um, that is, Eheyeh lecha, davar hamitbakesh le'olam sheneemar, Eheyeh katal Israel. I will be like dew to Israel. All right, that I can understand. That God comes like dew, which is always welcome. Sometimes we want more than that, so we ask for Geshem. We can understand this in a very limited frame. But now we come to the same issue, and with this we'll probably finish. Uh, another late 19th century Hasidic commentary on the Torah, who says this. We need to understand this business about dew flying away, about dew evaporating. How does that help Abraham? Um, Israel said, let, let God come like rain to us. And God responded, I will be like due to Israel. That's the, the Gemara we just looked at. Israel said, like rain, they wanted rain, because rain thoroughly moistens melachlech, melachlech, lachlach, uh, again a doubling. Rain thoroughly wets the earth, irrigates the earth, and stays in the earth. That is rain, you know, gets sunk into the earth, and you can, you can feel the rain remain. And it's a source of fertility. But God answered, rain is not the thing to ask for. Because if you had that kind of external, right, something entering you from the outside, God's blessing, entering you in this way that, that fills you up, and you are just an object, then it, what, the blessing would not arise from yourself. Not machmat atzman. It would not be the kind of blessing that you need. What you need is something like dew. God should be to you like dew, which touches for a moment. It's there, glimmering in the sunshine, and then it evaporates. And all it does is arouse your own inner, how does he put it here? Tarikh l'orer et shalahem. It, 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 it arouses the inner moisture of the grass. Now, I don't know in botanical terms exactly how this works, but you can see what the, how the image works. The dew is there for an instant and then departs. But meantime, the, the grass feels moisture arising from within it, from its own resources, and that's what creates the blessing. The creation, the, the blessing, has to be a kind of chemical response of the receiver and the giver. The giver, all right, you say God is outside, but that's only part of the truth. God is also in your dryness, in your need for rain, in your need for, for, for moisture, and in your capacity for being woken up, in your capacity for being aroused. All it takes is a little hint of some kind. That is God. God comes to make very slight appearances, you know, almost almost not there. Other people don't even notice it, but you are aware enough of yourself to notice how you come alive. And that coming alive is so even in relation to sin. And that's how the Shem Yishmuel then tries to make sense of Abraham's sins. Abraham's early life, the trauma, right, the repressed trauma of his life. And God reassures Abraham, 
it's very reassuring to be told to be told such a thing. God says to him uh, there that uh, <coughs> excuse me that the uh, the sins had a part to play in the making of Abraham. That is that Abraham metabolized those sins right, in such a way as to reject what was not good and to make use of that first stage of his life in which he had some of the very positive uh, positive aspects of any religious passion, you know, of any passion. But suddenly there's something there that offers something and he, it is sufficient to arouse him to his need for something else. Sufficient to arouse him to dissatisfaction. Now you can't get dissatisfaction with the the false thing, unless you've actually had some kind of satisfaction, right? For a, for a moment, it seemed like the right thing. And then you became capable of moving. And the great blessing is that capacity for moving, that capacity then for looking for something else. And that is always desirable, says God, to Abraham. Right? If there's one thing that is good for you and your people after you, all the people who will come after you, uh, come out of you, of him wondering, is that kind of divine restlessness. Something about a capacity to listen to a certain voice that says, Lech Lecha. Go into your own being and recognize the disturbances. Recognize what's not at ease with, with the way things are. Um, the Svatimet, in his way, then brings us around full circle. And in number 11, and he answers the question that we began with and that the Ramban begins with, who was Abraham that God chose him? What had Abraham done to deserve God saying to him, Lech Lecha? It makes Abraham into an inert, right? There's no history. Then he's somehow inert. God just picks him and starts pouring blessing into him. No, the point is, the point is not that God chose him. What he wants to say is that that um, that Abraham was not chosen. He wasn't loved ahead of time. God says lech lecha to every human being at all times. Svatimet always likes to make that point through time and space. It's a universal. God says lech lecha to every human being. We're now completely. Uh, 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 We've, we've plucked up our roots from the historical context here. This is a universal. But Abraham heard and took in the message. Shama the Kibel. He allowed it into himself. He had open ears, open, right, open eyes. Something in him was ready. Readiness allows revelation to happen. It will not happen. You know, it may be there, but it will not be received. And the chidush, the, 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 the thing that all this imagery has made us aware of is that there's something live, spiritually, spiritually and in every other way, alive inside a human being, which is in a way God inside the human being. God responding to the God who then calls, calls to a certain kind of discomfort. They're not going to be comfortable for, for, for a while at any, at any rate. And that muhanut, that readiness to go on a journey, is not a one-time affair. It's not something that happens once at the beginning of history. Uh, it happens all the time. It happens every day we try something new. It happens every day when we don't simply collapse into a kind of lethargy, into a kind of inertia of, well, that's the way things are. Even acceptance and acceptance is a great thing. Even acceptance has about it something dynamic. There has to be something, a sense of life feeding into that acceptance. But I'm finding more life in some way in that ability to be inside myself, and to be to be where where the where the life is really happening. Um, I think we have to stop. We're well over time. Um, if anyone has questions, please do write me. Um, I, I think it's easy to get hold of my emails. It's not on your chat at the moment. Thank you very much for being there. Um, thank you especially to the people who allowed me to see your faces.
I hope to see you next week. Thank you very much.